Wealthmanagement.com presents Success Zone, a podcast dedicated to bringing financial advisors sweeping insights beyond the market headlines to help them become more savvy about the industry, transform their practice, enhance their marketing skills, and take their business to the next level. Listen in for a wealth of information that includes remarkable success stories and expert advice from the industry's key players and most successful and skilled financial professionals. Hello and welcome. You are listening to The Success Zone from WealthManagement.com. With us today is Sheila Kafari Agassi, Executive Vice President with United Planners Financial Services, a BD and RIA firm in Scottsdale, Arizona, who has done extensive work in the arena of succession planning, continuity planning, valuation assistance, deal support, and coaching for advisors facing questions and needing assistance in the arena of planning for the succession of their practices. Sheila has been helping coach advisors on the pros and cons and the do's and don'ts, common solutions, unique scenarios, and pairing of like-minded advisors, which is unfortunately much more complex than pairing a great wine with a meal. We'll be discussing case studies, statistical data on the subject, and much more during today's call. Good afternoon, Sheila. How are you? Doing well, Eric. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this, this is exciting. I, mean, I love, love this topic. It's something that every advisor faces, correct? This is true. Every advisor should face it if they have not yet already. Well, hopefully, I mean, if they're successful, they're definitely going to have to face it at one point. So how did your passion originate on the topic of financial advisors, succession planning? You know, it really started in about 2012 as I was reviewing a study that was released by Investment News. Inside that study, the statistical data suggested that 93% of advisor respondents did not have a legally binding contract for succession in place for their practice. And 92% of advisors indicated that they understood that it was high risk not to have their intentions Mm -hmm. documented, but yet they did not have a course to go through and and complete that step. Mm. 44% of the respondents actually said they had a plan to develop a plan. So it it was not for a lack of thinking about it. In that same survey, 75% of advisors said that they had no idea what the value of their practice was. And You know, knowing that the average age of advisors across the industry at that time was age 55, those figures were just really alarming to me. Absolutely. uh, You know, really created an itch, if you will, to assist uh, those advisors who found themselves in that position or, Mm. or as a component of that statistical information. After all, we're talking about financial advisors here. This is what they do for a living. Um, If we were discussing these types of results, statistical results from an advisor's own book of business, specifically their collective group of clients, we would say that advisor was not doing a very good job for their clients. Mm -hmm. So goes the story of the cobbler's son, right? With torn shoes or the dentist kid with neglected teeth. Financial advisors in the industry have not done a great job of preparing for their own future. So I really just saw this as an opportunity to assist advisors uh, by providing them turnkey planning to help get to the next steps of planning for their business. As a broker dealer in an RIA firm, you know, we understand the advisors of the front line out there looking out for the needs of their clients. And, and oftentimes, you know, they just forget to stop and look in the mirror and implement their own strategies and advice. Mm-hmm. So while it's our expectation that the advisors act in a fiduciary manner with their own clients, we really just saw this as an opportunity to take on that fiduciary role to the advisor and assist them, their families, their clients, and their own firms uh, that they're associated with, and whether that be you know United Planners as the broker dealer, or their own DBA, or their own RIA, you know any one affiliated with us um, in in taking those steps and and making a, a really easy pathway and a course for them to complete the necessary steps so so that they could sleep better at night. We call it a win 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 win, a four way win, and developed what we call the Leaps Program. Gotcha. The LEAPS program. Now, I have not heard of that, and I I know that we're going to be talking 
a lot more about that in this podcast. But before we hit that, I've got some other questions. I've been working with advisors for many, many years, and I can tell you that I know the ones I've worked with, they care passionately about their clients and they work very hard for their clients. But there's definitely two inevitable factors of life that they tell their clients, and that's death and taxes. So advisors know this. <laughs> so what is, why, why do you think that they put off this type of planning? Well, it's a loaded question because there are multiple reasons, of course. Um, no two reasons or reasons are, are the same for any two advisors. Mm-hmm. But some of those reasons include, you know, lack of financial planning themselves. I know nobody wants to hear that, but in often cases they haven't saved enough over the years. And, you know, maybe that's because they've rather heavily invested in their own business mm-hmm. and just haven't financially prepared to retire, which is one of the reasons why it's so important to know the value of your practice. Maybe you've just turned around and put all your money right back into, you know, your business. And and that's why there's not fluid cash available, you know, to, to retire on. Some advisors, you know, just enjoy so much what they're doing. They refer to this as, you know, I'm, I'm just going to die at my desk. <laughs> Even then, unfortunately, they do need to have, at minimum, a continuity plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some advisors have thought tremendously about this need, and they just have not yet found the right successor. Uh, They, you know, between a successor, continuity partner, or maybe they just haven't found the right program to assist them. Some actually know who they'd like to succeed them, but Funding the acquisition becomes burdensome mm-hmm. and a showstopper that, you know, well, I know this person will be my successor, but they haven't documented those next steps because the questions still loom on how to fund that acquisition. And then there are those others that are just too busy to even stop and think about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so focused on servicing the needs of their clients that they just have not stop to think about their own personal needs. You know, one thing I know for sure from the figures that I mentioned earlier reported in the 2012 uh, survey, things are getting better, not worse. And a lot of that is driven by clients asking their advisors the tough questions such as, you know, what happens to me if something happens to you? That's really invoking the thought of the advisors and they have to answer that question for their clients. So so things are getting better and there are new programs now available uh, to assist. Oh, I would agree. If a client isn't asking the question, you know, they're thinking about it. And so, I mean, that's, that, I mean, seriously, they, they, they've got to think about that and say, okay, my advisor's really old. <laughs> God bless them. They've done a great job, but what happens if? So, and I know that other people are thinking about this also. I've also heard that there are some, some serious focus on continuity planning and succession planning by regulators, both FINRA and the SEC. Do you see this as a driver in some of the change created in the recent years? You know, it is definitely a component. So we talked a little bit about, you know, the the clients helping drive some of this change. I think education is driving some of this change, but the regulators definitely have a, a an impact to some of the change management that's occurring uh, in this segment. So uh, FINRA is doing their part to encourage advisors to plan for the future and make sure clients are not left with nowhere to turn, right? The, the regulators are focused on the clients and the clients' needs. Some of those changes include, you know, mandated continuity planning. Uh, we call it continuity planning or, or business uh, continuance planning. Mm-hmm. And, and this really includes notable action in the event of catastrophic event, uh, like a natural disaster, such as a flood, a fire, you know, anything that creates a need to relocate or work remotely. Uh, fail safes and cybersecurity are major components of this type of planning and working through logistical challenges are paramount for any business. It doesn't matter what business you're in uh, to be able to survive in the event of a disaster. So that type of continuity planning is really under phrase disaster recovery planning. All right. Another thing that the, the regulators have done is, is helped bring younger advisors into the industry. So we talked earlier about the average age of advisors being 55. We started to see that eke up to 56, 57. 
we're starting to see that stabilize a little bit and, and even start to inch downwards because, you know, again, FINRA especially has helped make it a little bit more cost effective for younger advisors to enter this industry. Uh, Historically, starting a financial services firm, especially in the independent channel, has been very expensive, Uh, so much so that it's deterred many younger prospective advisors from entering our space. And with FINRA's recent action to separate out the exam process and create an entry level type of exam called the SIE, which stands for the Securities Industry Essentials Exam, allows an advisor to delegate responsibilities, right? To to say, younger advisor, go out, pass this baseline exam. Show me you can pass a test without investing a lot of capital to fund that person. Typically an advisor says, well, personalities match, morals and ethics match. Sometimes you get to the point where it's time to take the exam and that person just cannot take an exam Mm -hmm. for for the life of them. So uh, separating out this exam, I think has really helped encourage younger advisors to at least take the SIE, prove that they can pass that baseline exam, and then they can walk in the door with some level of accreditation and that they're really serious about this industry. You know, further, I'd say the scrutiny that's now being placed on independent RIAs, especially for smaller practices, those sole practicing offices, the books and records requirements, the cybersecurity requirements, the disaster recovery planning, the WSPs, written supervisory procedures. There is so much documentation that is required that sole practitioners are no longer as interested as in running their own independent RIA. So that's really helped drive some of these smaller practices to join ensemble firms Mm -hmm. where there are naturally built in succession possibilities, larger infrastructure to deal with a lot of this changing environment. So, you know, I've seen the regulators kind of help those sole practitioners join larger firms to assist in a lot of you know, just the automation and, and plug and play, but that also provides them with some turnkey, you know, succession opportunities. So last, I'll just comment on FINRA rule 2040. It is very specific to indicate that the only way to pay a non-registered person, which would be the heirs or the estate of a previously registered advisor, the only way to do that is through a bona fide contract between the retiring registered representative and their successor. Mm -hmm. So it is almost a letter of instruction to the successor that potentially a a percentage of revenue from the firm is paid to a specific receiver. And that would be the beneficiary of the retiring advisor. So, you know, it, it obviously no soliciting of new business or opening of new accounts or sharing in commissions, but as long as there is that bona fide contract in place that justifies the compensation being paid, that meets the rules and guidelines laid out by FINRA. And for this reason, I believe advisors are beginning to do a better job of preparing for the future and documenting their intentions so at least their loved ones can receive some benefit of their hard work and lifetime of built relationships. Absolutely. And I love that. I love to hear this kind of news because I know that the statistics for for many years have, I think it was uh, for every three advisors retiring, there was only one entering the business and that's abysmal. And so I'm I'm hoping some of these changes change that um, or really, really create an environment where they can have more success in these plans. So speaking of those plans, If I want to talk a little bit about what an advisor should do if they haven't taken these steps. I know that you've referenced continuity planning, succession planning, disaster recovery planning, and understanding the value of your practice through evaluation process. These, all these terms, some of them seem like they're, you could be intermatched or they could be swapped out. What's truly the difference in all these different terms? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, these the terminology is thrown around pretty loosely in our industry, and I don't know that advisors truly understand the difference between a continuity plan and a succession plan. 
disaster recovery is pretty easy. So we'll hit that first one, Mm -hmm. the the easy one first, right? Uh, Just what it sounds like when disaster strikes. What is the plan? Think natural disaster. can be anything from a power outage to staff taking an unexpected leave of absence to flood, fire, earthquake. You get the idea. Yep. So what happens in the event of a devastating event that prevents the normal course of business, what actions are taken, and all of this has to be documented and supported by the firm's WSPs. Uh, When the SEC or FINRA walks in, this may be one of the first things they ask for. So there's really been a lot of regulatory focus in this particular area. So disaster recovery, everybody needs to have one. There's no excuse not to. Uh, We'd never know when disaster may strike. Exactly. Exactly. So let's next talk a little bit about continuity plan. Think of continuity planning really tied more to your key man, right? The rainmaker, the Mm -hmm. relationship person, the owner of the firm, the person that the firm cannot survive without. They are the revenue generator. They're the ones out in front of the clients. They own the client relationships. If the producer creating the revenue for the operation is disabled, short or long term or worse yet, passed away, Mm -hmm. dead. How does the show go on? And that is really what we're talking about when we discuss continuity planning. Where do the clients turn for service and advice? How do the bills get paid? So continuity plan creates a clear instruction to the BD, the RIA, uh, the custodians, the sponsor companies, the mutual fund families to reassign the clients to the continuity partner. But equally as important, it creates a revenue stream to that person's spouse, their beneficiary, their estate. Got it. It it provides for the, you know, the the cost infrastructure. What happens with the staff, with the rental agreements, with the technology? Sometimes there is a triggering event that maybe starts off as a short-term disability and then leads into long-term disability. Mm. That continuity planning document should clearly articulate who makes the determining factor that a disability is in fact long-term. Think mental incapacity. Think you know, some of these, these debilitating diseases that we know exist. And, um, you know, we, we heard from our clients pop up as, as a component of life, you know, while the family is grieving over the loss of their loved one, that's not a time for them to step in and scramble and try to keep the business alive. So you're really doing your family a favor by making sure that you have a continuity plan. In fact, I will say that there is zero excuse Mm -hmm any advisor not to have a disaster recovery and continuity plan in place. I mean, frankly, it's just negligent not to have one. But then again, you know, I'm pretty passionate about this stuff. So <laughs> well, I, I would agree 100 percent. Let me ask you one follow up question to this. Let's say, you know, we, we, we kind of call that the hit, hit by the bus scenario, right? I mean, that's kind of what I've what I've termed it when I've worked with clients in the past. But what happens if they are incapacitated, but there's a possibility of coming back out? So a coma, right? With a right. continuity plan, is it possible for the advisor to take back the business or take the business back over, be, it be handed back to them? It is. And, and that's where, you know, the continuity plan will be very specific about short-term disability Got it. And, and what time period a short-term disability covers. You know, maybe maybe the advisor is going through uh, chemotherapy exactly. or, yep. or, you know, we're in a, in a bicycle accident and has a broken hip and just can't get back and forth at the office every day. So typically inside that continuity agreement, there will be a provision for short-term disability where the continuity partner comes in and is paid an hourly rate. That's going to vary across mm. the U S what that hourly rate is, but It'll be indicated and agreed to by all parties in the document that if someone needs to step in and just handle matters for a few hours a day, maybe two hours a day, they will be compensated X amount. Got it. The compensation continues to flow to the advisor. And that is still that advisor's practice while they are in that short-term disability realm. Once it's determined that the advisor typically six months is used in the situation of, of a coma, for mm-hmm. example. Mm-hmm. They've not come back to the practice within a three to six month period. 
that would then require a doctor's note, typically two doctor's notes, to indicate that this is a long-term disability. And that's when the next step provisions would kick in and the assets would be reassigned. Got it. So that's obviously much different than succession planning, which I believe is the next thing you're going to cover. So thank you for clearing that up for me. That's true. So succession planning is a bit more tricky. Uh, Going back to the reasons why we discussed earlier that, you know, why advisors don't have a plan in place, any and or all of them may be applicable to, you know, the listening audience today. Succession planning is really what I refer to as choosing your retirement date. It's looking into the future and saying, on this day, I want to spend more time with the grandkids or at the cabin or on my favorite beach. And and that may be motivated by a spouse yearning to spend that time uh, elsewhere. Whatever the motivation is, maybe maybe your own staff is motivating you <laughs> to mm-hmm. spend more yeah. time out of the office. Um, but whatever that motivation is, you know, it, it, succession planning is really a well thought out plan with a lot of execution, a lot of documentation, many steps involved to provide the ideal outcome for all parties. I've seen some of the most creative ways to accomplish this endeavor. I mean, we're talking about the fact that no two cases ever seem to be identical. There is just not a turnkey templated document, one size fits all solution to succession planning. And, and that's why, you know, a lot of advisors are kind of stalemated in, in this process is there are so many options. It can be intimidating breaking this process down into baby steps, making sure your disaster recovery plans in place, looking at choosing a continuity partner. Those are the, the initial steps to kind of take to inch you toward a complete plan. And maybe you're one of those, I want to die at my desk guys. Hmm. Well, your, your continuity plan has you covered. You don't have to create a succession plan. Funding is really a major component of this process. And they range everyone everywhere from seller financing to an outright cash purchase. You know, we, if, if we have time today, we can explore some of these options as we move through the call. But uh, there are some really great lending institutions that do this for a living and have found the financial services industry to be, you know, a, a, a great place to offer these lending resources. Gotcha. Um, And then last, the last area of focus is really on the valuation process. So as we talk about funding and financing, it is really important to have a baseline to understand what your practice is worth. And maybe it's for the purpose of succession planning. Maybe it's for the purpose of continuity planning or estate planning, whatever it is that you might be doing or, or other personal reasons But it can also be for the purposes to apply for a business loan, to infuse your practice, to get to the next level. Now, maybe you're looking for uh, a business loan and and the valuation process will really assist in, in getting you there. So maybe it's also so that you can understand the shortfalls in your existing practice so that you can correct those while you remain in your accumulation years and want to maximize the value of your practice for a future sale. A lot of advisors are using that valuation process now to understand, okay, if I bring down the average age of my client, if I have Mm -hmm. a higher percentage of recurring revenue, if I outsource my money management solutions because it's highly replicatable, if I have great technology infrastructure such as a CRM or longevity with my staff, low overhead at costs and expenses. All of those things are going to help to increase your multiple when you go through the valuation process to prepare for a succession in the future. Yeah, it's it's easy to see, really easy to see why advisors might want to put this off. Uh, it could be I think a lot of them think this is just a ton of work, right? It's got a, a lot of moving parts, a ton of work to get to that end result. And knowing how busy advisors are taking care of their own clients and serving the needs of their clients, it doesn't really leave them a lot of time to think about their own futures or what happens if they're not around. Uh, it kind of seems like writing an insurance policy on themselves may be easier. 
<laughs> so I definitely agree. Life insurance can be one of those ways to fund a continuity acquisition, uh, it, especially if you get somebody else to pay the premium. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> so what are some of the other ways that an advisor can begin to fund their future acquisition, whether that be due to an untimely continuity plan, triggering event, or a plan succession? So I'll list some of the primary options that I've seen. Um, you know, as we go and talk about continuity again, in the event of untimely or an unexpected event, I find, you know, of course the clients haven't been prepared and, and they haven't latched on to this new advisor. Mm -hmm. Since we never know when our time is up or when that time is going to come, you know, the continuity plan just takes over and the clients might feel a little bit lost when those questions arise in a client's mind, it is possible that they start to look at some of their other options and don't just gravitate toward the new continuity partner. Mm -hmm. So in the event of short-term disability, I find, you know, again, we talked about that hourly rate. Mm -hmm. It's negotiated. The clients are going to stick around. In the event of long-term disability or death, I like to speak structure these deals based on a percentage of future revenue. So it's important to delineate that we're speaking revenue here. This is not a commission share. This is not commission being paid to non-licensed persons. Gotcha. It's in fact a percentage of revenue over a fixed period of time. And that really seems to serve all parties well, again, because there was no preparation. We didn't prepare the clients mm -hmm. to start working with the successor. So, if the successor in, in the, you know, this example is forced to work off of a calculation, meaning, you know, we have a $3 million valuation on the practice and that is the figure that I owe for succeeding this practice. Well, that may be a losing opportunity for the successor. They may not see the benefit in that and therefore it, it narrows the pool of advisors interested in that type of arrangement. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't want the successor paying for something that they're not receiving the benefit of. Correct. But yet we also want to really motivate the successor to maintain the client relationship so that their portion of the revenue continues over the predetermined time period and then beyond. Mm -hmm. So again, that win, 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 win uh, type scenario, you know, in another way is it, with a well thought out succession plan, there are seller carried notes, there are bank or entity funded opportunities, there are straight up cash purchases, which of course usually come at a, a discount to the valuation. I have seen bidding wars on valuations. Hmm. We've heard a lot about there being multiple buyers for every seller. Well, there are multiple buyers in each category. You know, it, it, a lot of it depends on. I, I like to start the conversation with the seller, define for me your ideal candidate. What does that look like? And, and we've talked about everything from, you know, religious preferences to, you know, to do age or, or height. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's, there's a lot of preferences that advisors have, which basically means they want to replicate themselves. They need someone just like them in their role. Really, a lot of it is based on personality. Yeah. You know, are they storytellers? Are they analytical? You know, if their clients are made up of a, a number of uh, engineers, well, you're going to have to have a left brain analytical person sitting in that seat uh, communicating facts to the client base or, or the clients just aren't going to stay. Absolutely. So I've seen everything from tri-party agreements, third-party funding, seller carried, uh, where everybody maintains skin in the game. I'm a personal fan of clawback provisions. And, you know, frankly, the longer the note lasts, the more the premium tends to increase from the original valuation. The last option I will touch on today includes, you know, internal purchase agreements. So I've seen the operational team of a producer group earn their way into a purchase agreement. So it can be done through salary deferral, a stock purchase agreement or plan. 
Uh, and in the most uncommon of scenarios, I've seen forgiven arrangements through blood, sweat, and tears and hard time spent. <laughs> you know, of course, it's very important to always consult a tax professional to discuss the tax ramifications of any of these scenarios, understand what the consequences are of each option. But uh, there's a hundred ways to complete this, if not more. Sheila, earlier in the podcast, you mentioned the LEAPS program, and I know I want to get right back into that. And you've said a couple times, creating a win-win-win-win scenario. And I think it was four wins if I said that right. Tell me a little bit about what you meant by that. Sure. So, you know, I also mentioned being a fiduciary to advisors, and and that's where as we were creating this LEAPS program, we wanted to structure it. With this four-way win, or at least that's how it ended up being, is it was a four-way win. Uh, the first win is is for the clients. You know, who do they turn to if their advisor isn't there to help them? And and the second win is the family of the advisor. You know, how do they get paid if he or she is not there to provide for them anymore? And and the third win is, you know, how does the advisor rest easy at night? knowing when he's not there for his clients, he or she, there for their clients or, the, or their family, that they are all well taken care of. And the fourth win is really about the firm reducing liability, making sure that clients are not left out scattering, asking multiple new people for mm-hmm. advice, and knowing exactly what the advisor's intentions were so that the firm can act prudently on those wishes and carry through with exactly what it was the advisor wanted. So how does LEAPS take care of that? Yeah. So first of all, LEAPS is an acronym because uh, our industry doesn't have enough of those. Oh, no. No, I haven't heard some before. <laughs> <laughs> LEAPS stands for Legacy Exit and Acquisition Planning Strategies. All right. The program was designed to hit on all of the components that we've talked about today and and more. So there's an a la carte offering that includes low cost continuity planning, succession planning, valuations, and counsel. We wanted to pair our advisors with one another. So we call that component the successor search solutions. I can't say that very fast. So (laughs) that's a tongue twister. Successor search solutions. Yes. Um, Those are intended to, to, help advisors find the right partner. You know, I'm finding that it takes about five years walking beside someone to understand that you're hitting on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. That includes, you know, the ethical components. How do you provide advice? What do you do in this situation? I'm a huge fan of asking questions in an interview that start with, tell me about a time when, right? Tell me Mm -hmm. about a time when you were faced with a moral or ethical decision, what it was and how you handled it. The, to me, we can speed up some of the, the five-year you know, walk-aside yeah, <laughs> absolutely. by asking some of those really tough questions, you know, especially if someone's had some great life experience where they can share what they did in really difficult situations. Uh, the Success Research Solutions programs it come in a, a tri-level offering. It's a silver, a gold, and a platinum Really, you know, can we pair you with someone internal to the firm or do we need to go outside the firm and use this as a recruiting opportunity to pair like-minded advisors? We are in growth mode as an organization. This has been a wonderful way for us to make sure that all of our existing advisors have continuity uh, plans in place. And and, uh, we currently have about 30% of our advisors with all of these items buttoned up, hmm. we continue to work through, you know, the remaining advisors. And, and in many cases, we're out looking for advisors with like minds who, who would either be a successor to one of our aging advisors or who may need a successor. We've got a lot of younger ensemble practices in growth mode. So, so it was really about, Pairing advisors in the industry, you know, we're a really dynamic firm. We have a tremendous value proposition. And so that part's easy. Having advisors choose to join us, knowing that there is all this other opportunity available to them, 
just made perfect sense in, in the creation of this program. We did engage really trusted partners, uh, such as Succession Resource Group, mm-hmm. funding resources such as Oak Street Funding, Live Oak Bank, uh, similar uh, smaller local credit unions, uh, similar uh, providers of you know funding and, and lending. So Succession Resource Group handles the documentation components, the legalese, the contract. We did not want anyone to be bound necessarily to United Planners. Mm-hmm. In often cases, you know, they have their own independent RIA. Maybe they're IARs only of their own indie RIA. Maybe they're IARs and, and hybrid affiliates, uh, you know, with the firm and, and our RIA. But we wanted to offer a lot of freedom and flexibility at a really deeply discounted price. So we've actually engaged a lot of these firms on retainer in order to provide these services at a a fraction of the street price. We've developed this intake form process where, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we we start by defining the ideal candidate. Tell me who is the perfect person for this role. And then we design marketing programs to go out and attract those persons. Mm. Um, so it's, you know, I, I think that might be another win. We might have to call it a win, 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 win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lot. That, that's a lot to say. You know, I, I love, I know I fully expect and not, not to burst anybody's bubbles here, but I fully expected you guys to do the homework, right? And, and that's what you did. You did the groundwork. You're, when you're talking about going out and, you know, engaging trusted partners, Right for financing and the the different paperwork that you guys do. Those are some of the things that I would expect from a program like this. But what I really love is the fact that you identify the fact that advisors are searching for somebody that is their replacement, meaning they're them, right? Because the relationships that they build with their clients were based on who they are personally, not the numbers they're running, not any of that other stuff. If they like you, they're going to do business with you. And so being able to find that person on that type of level, that's huge. And so that that's very impressive to me. And I love the fact that you're doing it. So my follow-up question to all of that is, what's your success rate like with this program? I mean, that's that's where it kind of boils down to, right? What How's your success rate? Well, sure. We talked about the reasons why advisors don't want to take these steps. And, and I mentioned those because I know them firsthand. It is uh, for you know, oftentimes they're just really, really busy and, and they're not accustomed to think of their own needs first. As fiduciaries to their clients, they put the needs of their clients before their own personal needs and therefore they stop thinking about themselves and turn all of their attention to their clients, which is you know, very honorable. Though we have had great success in this program and, and it is my goal to be at 100% of all of our advisors being engaged in at least some level of this program. Mm -hmm. We are currently at 30% of our advisors that have engaged at minimum the continuity components, the evaluation components, and and so forth. And as a smaller firm, we're really pleased at the level of concierge service that we're able to offer. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to continuing to inch forward and upward with these figures, we have aided in the sale of 17 unique practice types. Wow. That's huge. And, and a lot of those have come with these recruiting opportunities where someone's coming in from the outside, someone internal to the organization is acquiring that firm or the other way around. Someone joins our firm to acquire an existing advisor's practice. Sometimes It's been advisor to advisor internal to the organization. So, you know, we're seeing those numbers continue to increase year over year. There is a ton of work involved in helping coach through the sale of a practice and and the purchase of a practice. And we kind of stand in the middle as uh, the the mediator, if you will. We want to see everyone get a fair deal. We want to see the transaction make a lot of sense. And if we see something that just doesn't make sense, we're also coaching to that as well. All right, Sheila, that is fantastic. And I I know we're running out of time today, but I don't want to leave without doing this. Can you tell us just a little bit more about United Planners? 
Certainly, thank you. Uh, so United Planners is a full service independent broker dealer and RIA firm located in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, we have about 450 advisors nationwide. Uh, we are very RIA friendly. So about 40% of our advisors have their own independent RIA nice. and about 60% of our existing advisors are under our firm ADV. There are three key areas that make us very unique. Uh, the first being our structure. So we were formed in 1987 as a limited partnership. 55% of the firm is owned by our limited partners. Those are producing advisors who qualify to be limited partners of the firm. And 45% minority interest is owned by our general partners. Those are gentlemen here in Scottsdale. What's really important about the limited partnership structure is the fact that we are sharing 55% of the firm's annual profits right back to those who helped create that profitability in the first place. So very unique structure. Other, fir other firms have attempted to copy this model. However, it has never been done the way that it is done here. The second key area that we really differentiate ourselves in the IBD market is our culture. Knowing that approximately 150 of our existing advisors are limited partners, they have pride of ownership. They are sharing in the profits. They're, they're providing a lot of feedback with each other, with the home office. There's open dialogue. This feels like one big family. We call our national conference uh, homecoming or mm, nice. <laughs> you know, kind of Kind of a family reunion. So, yeah. so culturally, we really set ourselves apart. We never want to be the largest firm in the industry. We have n no interest there. Our very unique structure prevents any type of sale. So we will never be part of one of these larger firms because some deal was struck. It would take the majority vote of the limited partners to dissolve the limited partnership and therefore this firm will never be sold. So, mm -hmm. so that plays a factor into that pride of ownership component. So we talked about structure, culture, and the third one is really what I call how we define service. We mentioned 40% have their own NDRAA, 60 under our firm. That's a give or take any, you know, any given day. There are advisors who say, I'm done running my own RIA. I just want to plug and play. There are advisors who say, you know what, I'd like to form my own NDRAA. They're able to do that. But regardless, if they're under the firm or have their own, they're able to custody their assets under management with the large major custodians from TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, uh, Trust Company of America, now E-Trade Advisors, to Fidelity. We are not the traditional broker-dealer mentality that says you have to push everything onto a high-priced, inefficient uh, clearing platform. Instead, we are very open architecture. We refuse to take markups or any bips in the middle on third-party money managed programs again seeing ourselves as a fiduciary to the advisor so we practice what we preach here at the home office making sure that you know we we put the needs of the clients and the advisors before our own and and at the end of the day we run a very successful operation organization that is profitable and whatever those profits are the majority go right back to the advisors the last piece of that defining service I will talk about is technology. Mm. We just have so much time and attention into the infrastructure and the technology that our advisors have access to because we see our role as helping keep advisors out of trouble and helping advisors be more efficient. The more efficient they are, the more profitable they can be, the more profitable they are, the more profitable we are, and the more profits we have to share. So. You know, it's, it's really kind of back to basics, treating people well and with respect and, you know, solving for a business need. So I'll pause there and see if you have any other questions. Well, I, I've just got one last question, really, because we got to wrap this up. There are advisors that are listening to this right now thinking, you know, <laughs> my BD doesn't do that. Or I, I don't I don't find that this is the same conversation I have with my home office. If they'd like to reach out to you, if they just want to give you a call and chit chat, 
How do they get a hold of you? Sure. You know, even if they wanted to call and just find out if there's a succession opportunity that's available in their backyard. Mm, yeah. We encourage those phone calls. You will call and ask for any member of the partner development team, the partner development, and call us at 1-800-966-8737. Again, 1-800-966-8737. And please don't write that down. If you're driving, just pull this podcast back up when you get to your destination. Write down that number and make that call. Sheila, thank you so much for your time today. Do you have any other closing thoughts for us today? You know, I I would just encourage anyone who for any reason would not be part of the LEAPS program because they were not part of United Planners, I would just encourage them, please make sure you've got your disaster recovery Mm -hmm. plans in place. Please go forward with developing a continuity plan, and, and I hope that today's podcast was of assistance to you. I think it was fantastic. Thanks again for your time. Thank you. Have a great day. And thank you for listening to the Success Zone podcast from wealthmanagement.com. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when the Success Zone comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. Do yourself a favor and share this podcast with people in your office so you can all learn together. Again, thanks for listening. For everyone at wealthmanagement.com, this is Eric Johnson reminding you that to grow, you've got to learn. To learn, you have to listen. And when you do this, you'll find yourself in the success zone, which I think you'll agree is a great place to be. We'll see you next time. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of wealthmanagement.com. The mere appearance of content on the site does not constitute an endorsement by wealthmanagement.com. The content has been made available for information and educational purposes only. Wealthmanagement.com does not make any representation or warranties with respect to accuracy, applicability, fitness, or completeness of the content or of any sites listed or linked to the content. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service with any questions you have regarding your investment planning. 